me ask you a question. You know, um, what are some things that you like to think about? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about what do you like to think about? What do you think about? Some of you are thinking about the Broncos. Maybe. Yeah, most of you are not. Some of you are thinking about lunch. Is this going to work? Why does that work? What are some things that you like to think about? Or maybe I could ask it this way. What do you find yourself thinking on throughout the day? You know, I, I had a chance this week. Many people have asked, and some people know, and I'm not going to tell you all of it. But what do you like to think about? Maybe it's your family. Maybe it was, ooh, what are we having for Thanksgiving? Maybe it was, what kind of pie are we going to have? I don't know. But, but not talking about the holidays. What is it that you find yourself thinking about? Is it the worries of the world? Is it the, uh, am I going to get that next job promotion? I, we could go on for days and days and days. Uh, we had a, a neat experience because my, my ability with Christmas trees is dwindling very, very fast. Okay. Last year, if you remember, I told you a story that we uh, went up over the Mesa. There was a spot to pull off. We pulled off to go get a Christmas tree. Our kids were not as big as they are this year. And my balance is really bad. And I fell. And I just got frustrated. So I started crawling. I was wearing cowboy boots. And when you're crawling and you're in the snow, they turn into buckets very fast. And so that's what happened. And it just deteriorated very, very, very fast last year. And so this year, I thought I was planning well, and I said, let's go the day after Thanksgiving rather than going like December 15th. Do you guys know what happened on Friday? Anybody know? Yeah, you should not have been on the Mesa, okay? But not me. I was on the Mesa. And I thought... It was beautiful. We'll be all right. We can do this. And please, you can come give me all the advice after. I already got my, my scolding from Dean. Dean told me, he said, Jake, don't ever go on the Mesa in a snowstorm. And he, he elaborated on that, and I'll tell you more later. What was I thinking on Friday? I was thinking, Lord, I'm coming to meet you today. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Holy cow, that was weird. So when, I, when we were driving up, I thought it was okay. And I was driving up the Mesa. Bad mistake. Old Grand Mesa Road was open. I saw tire tracks. <laughs> I saw tire tracks. I thought, oh, I can do it. First mistake, I know. Dean already told me, if you go up in the snow, don't ever get off a road that, never get onto a road that's not plowed. He goes, those roads don't get plowed. I, I'm here to tell you that is a true statement. <laughs> they do not get plowed. So I went up Old Grand Mesa Road, and I thought this will be just fine. And once you start going, I, I see cars, like cars like Texas cars, okay? Like not four-wheel drive cars. And I thought, we're going to, it's okay. So I kept driving. I thought, I can do this. We'll be okay. And I look at my wife and I said, I don't know if we should do this. And I was such an idiot. I just kept going. I just thought, it'll be okay. So I got all the way up there. You know where the stop sign is? Yes. You can go right to Colburn or you can go left. There was no tire tracks to the right. I thought, oh, I'll go left. So I go left and I just keep going. And I keep going, and I keep going, and I get stuck. And I thought, well, Lord, we're going to get our Christmas tree right here. And so I stop. And my, my wife and my kids go out to get the Christmas tree. And they walk up the side, and they walk all around to get the Christmas tree. And they found one. And I said, Candace, I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of here. 
I guess I could back all the way down. I don't know. And it, it went south very fast. We got the Christmas tree. We got it on top of the car. We got it strapped down. Time just to turn the car around. Back, I thought, I'll just go really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. We ain't going nowhere. And I thought, Lord, I'm coming to meet you. And I won't tell you the rest of the story, except for as I sat there, I thought, Lord, my phone is dead, or my phone has no signal. I have nowhere to, I mean, I can't, I can't walk, period, let alone walk in in snow. And I tried everything I could do to get out. And I was up there for, we were up there for five hours, stuck, as we dug, and we dug, and we put branches under the car, and, and took everything inside the car to put under the tires and it was it's a wonderful story now that we are safe together it's good so um so what was i thinking about it was definitely not about god at that moment i said god there's another way you can teach me this but this morning i want to talk about the power of the mind our minds can't they mess you up my mind up there sitting in the snow stuck was not god help me it was what an idiot I am, which we all know that was true in that moment. But as, as I was there in the snow, I started to panic, and I couldn't even process what to do. And there was a time while I was there, as I said, Lord, I just stopped. And I just sat there, and I just prayed. And I said, God, could you just give me enough signal to send my location? And I was trying to send it to Kevin Shepard and John Cleaver. And I said, amen. And I looked at my phone and I had one bar. And it sent. It was cool. Now, I'll tell you the rest of the story later. Talk to me later. But we are home and we got out. But the power of the mind. What might distract you from focusing on God? Remember, two weeks ago, we started a series on, on how are we going to be a biblical church. And I said, if we are going to be a biblical church, we must have a high view of God and a high view of Scripture. But now the question for this week and next week is, how do we do that? How do we continue to have a high view of God? How do we continue to do it? Then I was thinking about this question. What might distract you from focusing on God? Well, being stuck in the snow distracted me from focusing on God. I don't know that I can remember being that cold before. And as we sat there, I thought, I only have a quarter of a tank of gas. And I thought, what should I do? I'll tell you more about that story in a few minutes. But if we are going to be a biblical church, we will have a high view of God. We will have a high view of Scripture. And this morning I want to talk about we will keep the focus on God. We will keep the focus on God. But the question is, how do we keep our focus on God? It could just be like Nike Swish. Just do it, right? Just do it. But isn't it hard? Well, since you don't answer, I can let me throw out some examples. Isn't it hard when you, uh, maybe you, you lose your job? Isn't it hard to keep your focus on God if you lose your job? Isn't it hard to keep your focus on God when your body is failing? Anybody's body is failing? You feel them breaking down? Isn't it frustrating? Isn't it discouraging? We've got to change that perspective. Wow, God, you give me another avenue of sharing the gospel. It's all right. The doctors need it. The nurses need it. It's okay. But it makes me think of uh, 2 Corinthians, I can't remember, 4, I think, something like that. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, right? Isn't that so true? Our bodies are breaking. Our bodies are breaking down. We may not have as much strength as we used to. It could be so many more. Any marriage conflicts, they're, they're real, aren't they? When you get married, it's great. But now you're not just dealing with one sinner in a home. Now you're dealing with two sinners in a home. And then you have kids. And now you've got three, four, five, six, seven. And, it's, and you're like, why does this happen? Well, let me tell you. 
You're both sinners. You're all sinners. Work together. How do we keep the right perspective of God? How do we keep from being, how do, how do we keep our focus on God? Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 2 with me. It, it was many weeks ago, maybe even a year ago, that we were in the book of Colossians. But, but let me bring you up to speed a little bit. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. He says there, see, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Do you remember what was going on at, at the church in Colossae? The, the church at Colossae, Paul writes, and he says, you need to remember that Christ is preeminent. Christ is over all. And there were some false teachers that had come into the church, and they were saying that you have to live this kind of lifestyle in order for you to be saved. And they started trying to take the church captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men. That's what they were faced with. And Paul writes to them and he says, look, watch out. In other words, he tells the church, keep your focus on God. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. need to do? All right. Now, you're just trying to confuse me in my story, Lucas. I had every ratchet strap connected to my toe strap, and up to the aspen trees. I had to get up this hill to get to the aspen trees. I fell many times trying to get up the hill. I was trying to crawl up the hill. The one thing I did right is I had snow boots on. Uh -huh. No cowboy boots. I crawled up there. I got there. I wrapped it around the trees, and I would, I would do the ratchet as tight as I possibly could and I would have somebody in the car trying to move it forward and I would try to move it little by little and my family was getting tree branches and they were breaking them putting them on our tires we took all of our winter mats out of the car to put it underneath the tires and what was going through my mind Jesus my whole family's coming to meet you my whole family's coming to meet you the power of the mind 
Does your mind ever get out of control? Our health is failing, our world is failing, but our God is still good. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. This was not planned, but this was the passage I was on with the kids this morning in youth group. Look at Matthew 22. This is becoming one of my all-time favorite passages in the Bible. It says in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. Now, we got to back up a little bit, okay? I can't remember the verse, but if you go back a little ways, remember that you had the Pharisees who were trying to catch Jesus in the wrong. And I think it's verse 15. They teamed up with the Herodians to try to catch Jesus in the wrong. So you have the Pharisees who are really focused on the, the religious aspects of the law. You have the Herodians who are really focused on the political side. And they, 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 they adamantly oppose each other, but they came together with one purpose, and that's to catch Jesus in the wrong. And then you had the Sadducees jump on board. The Sadducees didn't agree with them because they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels or demons, but they had the same goal, and that was to stop Jesus. And then you had, after Jesus silenced the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together for their powwow, right? Now we've got to come up with another plan. One of them, a liar, asked him a question, testing him, okay? So this Pharisee, who is a, a I don't know how you say, liar or lawyer, whatever you want, I don't care, okay? But this guy, who is obviously an arrogant man he comes to Jesus with one goal and that goal is to catch Jesus in the wrong and what he does verse 36 he says teacher what is the greatest commandment in the law that word law carries so much weight the word law is used 51 times in the Torah that's the first five books of the Bible the word law that this Pharisee was referring to is the 613 commandments that are found from Genesis to Deuteronomy. If you want the list of those, I will give them to you. I have every reference for every law of the 613. It is crazy. That is what this Pharisee is trying to do. He's trying to catch Jesus in the wrong. He says, which is the greatest in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and here it is, and with all your mind. All your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Then Jesus gives them bonus material, verse 39. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then this is the dynamite verse, verse 40. Jesus says, on these two commandments depend, what does it say? The whole law and prophets. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, love God and love people. That summarizes Genesis to Deuteronomy. Did you catch that? The entire law and the prophets. He, he takes them back to, the religious leaders, takes them back to the great Shema in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. I think it's on the screen. But it says here, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then he says, and this is the reference that Jesus goes to in Matthew 22. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind or might. Then he goes on in Deuteronomy, these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So in, in, in Matthew 22, in Deuteronomy 6, Jesus is really expounding on the power of the mind. He says, you've got to love God with your entire being. And I'm not going to break down what it means with your heart, soul, and all your mind. I'm not going to do that right now. That's for another time. The power of the mind. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Our minds get us in trouble 
Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing from prison to the church of Philippi. He says in 4.1, I have the key verse on the screen, verse 8, but 4.1, look at your Bibles. He says, therefore, and I usually I would ask, what is the therefore, therefore, but I'm not, for the sake of time, going to be able to answer that. He says, my beloved brother, in whom I long to see, my joy and crown, and in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So he gives a command to the church. He says, Church of Philippi, you need to stand firm in the Lord. In verses 2 through 7, he outlines what you need to do in order to stand firm. Now, guys, understand, he's talking to a church. He's writing from prison. Look at verse 2. He says, if you are going to stand firm, you've got to live in harmony. Verse 2, I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion. I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He says, look, if you're going to stand firm, if we are going to stand firm as a church, we've got to get along. That doesn't mean we have to agree, but we've got to get along. We have to get along with one another. Then he says, verse 4, you've got to rejoice in the Lord. You've got to take it to God, verse 6. You've got to do it with thanksgiving. And then what does he say, verse 8? Verse 8, he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, look at this word, dwell on these things. Think on these things. Because we have to control our minds. Our minds are so powerful. They can distract us in so many ways. Just as on Friday, my mind was not, was not thinking about God. I was thinking about coming to meet God. I was so scared. I was so nervous. I was not thinking on the things of God until I stopped. And I said, God, I need your help. I don't know what to do. The power of the mind. So how are we going to continually have our focus on God? Number one, understand the power of the mind. Number two, you got to understand the goal of Satan. Understand the goal of Satan. Uh, just a couple of very, very familiar verses. First Peter chapter 5. You can turn there. First Peter chapter 5. I have a question. The more you read your Bible, do you love your Bible all the more? I don't know. I just was, I was thinking about that this past week. Like, the more I read my Bible, the more I study my Bible, man, the more I love my Bible. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Listen to what, what Peter writes. He says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You see, Satan wants to take you down. Satan wants to take me down. You know, I, in my own life on Friday, I experienced Satan kind of getting into my life, right? Distracting me from trusting God. When I was out there in the snow, because I was, I, I was scared. Scared is probably too easy. Like, that doesn't describe how bad it was for me. I mean, it was terrible. It was so bad. And then dealing with my family in the car, it was bad. I'm about to tell my kids, I'll buy whatever fake tree you want. Or maybe next year we're just going to have a church outing to help Jake get a Christmas tree. I don't know yet how to do this. But I know not to get off the snow plowed roads. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, verse 13, just listen. It says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan 
disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Satan wants you, your families, to fail as believers. Think about uh, Ephesians 6. Do you remember that? He's writing to a church, and the first three chapters are theology, and the last three are practicality. And he says, so what? And he gets to chapter 6, and he says, what, remember what he says? Take up the whole armor of God so that you will be able to withstand the schemes of the evil one, right? I, I just have a question. I wonder how many of us got up this morning and, and actually said, God, I, I got to put on my, my spiritual armor. I got to get dressed spiritually. I, I wonder how many of us, in essence, ran out of our house spiritually naked, not ready for the spiritual battle. I don't know. Take up the, the whole armor of God. That's been a challenge for me because when I get up in the morning, I'm usually going already. And I don't think through every aspect of the armor of God. And, and I was thinking about it. Lord, maybe, maybe I need some visuals to help me. And go through the steps. I got my helmet. I got my shoes spiritually getting dressed every morning because I don't know if I'm right, but I think there's probably a lot of Christians who would openly admit that they, they didn't actually get their spiritual armor on and they went out for the day. We've got to understand that, that Satan wants us to fall. Number three, we've got to understand our continual need our continual need, you're probably not there, but go to Colossians chapter 3. Remember in Colossians 2, he says, um, watch out, right? He says, don't have anything to do with uh, empty philosophy and things like that. And then chapter 3, he says, verse 1, therefore, well, what is the therefore, therefore? It's there because what he just said in chapter 2, verse 8, where he says, see that no one takes you captive. If any, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind the power of the mind, there it is, on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Anybody ever play hide and seek? I think we can have an awesome time at night when it's dark, going over to Wick Hall, playing hide and seek in every room as a church family. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think it would be fun. But have you ever... I don't care how young you are or how wise you are, hide and seek is always awesome. But what does the seeker do? Thank you, Pierce. Find the people. And you keep seeking until you find them, right? In your spiritual life, how are you doing at seeking, active, I-N-G, seeking the things above? It never stops. We know as a, if we're going to be a biblical church, we've got, to, we've got to have a high view of God, say it verbally, live it, but we have to continually be seeking to have that high view of God. We are to set our minds. We've got to control our minds. Your mind ever get out of control? In the worries of the world? The worries of your family. Those of you who have kids, you ever get scared on how your kids are going to grow up? My, my dad might still be concerned how I'm going to be when I grow up. How are we going to turn out? you got to understand that you have a, a need to always set your mind on things above. Just listen to this account in 1 Chronicles 22. 
He says there, this is a neat example. First Chronicles 22. When was the last time you had somebody tell you to go to First Chronicles? First Chronicles 22, 17. David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Then he says in verse 19, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise, therefore, and build the sanctuary of the Lord God, so that you may bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. He says there, seek the Lord your God. If we're going to have a high view of God, a continual high view of God, we will continue to seek the things above. Uh, Paul addresses it in, in Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8 verse 4, it says, So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. You can continue reading through Romans 8, but you have got to set your mind on the things above. He addresses the issue in, in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 a very familiar verse he says do not love the world nor the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the father but is from the world the world is passing away and also its lust but the one who does the will of god lives forever and we could ask what is god's will well, I think it's if you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, I don't have this in my notes, but 1 Thessalonians 4, a little bit on, a little like verse 2 or 3, he says, God's will for you is your sanctification. You know what that is? That, that's a progressive sanctification. That is that continual process of growing in your walk with Jesus. I love what it says in, in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, Matthew's writing and his audience is primarily Jewish and he writes and he, the, the theme of Matthew is he, he really presents Jesus as king. Because if you remember the, the Jewish people, what are they looking for? Even now, they're looking for the Messiah, right? Where is the Messiah? Where is the Messiah? Well, Matthew writes and he says, let me tell you about your king. Let me tell you about your Messiah. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, but where, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also we have a need to always be setting our minds on things above we have got to control our minds. Friday, my mind was out of control. I was in disarray. I was in panic. I, I didn't know what to do. And when I got that one bar, the text message went out to the Cleavers. They actually got my location. They were coming up. They called Richard Menapace to bring his Jeep up with a winch on it as well. And they were coming up and they were like, how far did they go? And by the grace of God, I finally got the car unstuck. And I met them on the road, and we ended up getting out. We ended up getting the cleaver stuck, but they got them out, and we, we all got home safely. But I'll be honest, 
my mind was out of control. Uh, search and rescue was called. And I was greeted by one of them. He goes, are you the pastor? <laughs> Absolutely not. His, his grandson actually plays with our kids at the coffee shop sometimes. And it was really neat to talk to him. And it was neat to see how all that worked out. But uh, my mind was out of control in that situation, how it all worked out. But God was glorified, and I had, we had a lot of time to observe God's beautiful creation. I don't know if I've ever seen so much snow come down so fast in my entire life. It was crazy. But my mind was out of control. And I said, Lord, couldn't you have taught me that lesson easier? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, he tells the church at Colossae, but now you also, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. And having put on the new self is, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Verse 11, he says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian uh, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, here it is, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I love that passage of scripture. You know why I love it so much? Because when he says in verse 12, put on a heart of, and he lists those things. This is not conditional. If you know Christ, if you are a genuine believer, you will put these things on. I don't know about you, but isn't it easy for us to make our behavior conditional? I'm going to be kind if that person treats me right. You know, that's, that's a lie from the pit of hell. When you are not kind, when I am not kind, the problem is, is that you and I are not loving God. If we're going to be biblical, and I can show you that in John 14, 15, and where he says... We go back to Matthew 22, how Jesus summarized the entire law with that Pharisee. He says, the greatest is love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Last passage. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. The idea of the book of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. The first few chapters is he talks about, and the author says, Jesus is superior to angels. And then in verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2, fixing. That's, we're never done here on earth. We are always, this is what we are to be doing all the time as brothers and sisters in Christ. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who's endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The question that I asked at the very beginning, how do we keep our focus on God. Well, I think there's three things. Understand the power of our minds. My mind gets out of control so much. And I didn't even talk about the ways that it gets out of control. It's easy for us to be selfish, right? It's easy. And I'll bring up a topic that we never talk about in church. But guys, pornography is on the, the, the 
oh, I don't know, the increase, isn't it? It's everywhere. Pornography is everywhere. And people are not honest with each other about the struggle of pornography. But we say, well, nobody knows. Nobody knows. God knows. God knows. Our minds get us in trouble all of the time. It doesn't matter if it's pornography, if it's selfishness, if it's depression. I think depression is real, don't you? But I think the number one answer to depression is the authority of God's word. There is a time and a place to go the medical route. I know that. But our minds get us in so much trouble. And we have to understand that. We have to understand that Satan wants us to fall. Satan wants us to be in that pattern. Satan wants us to be in that position. And then we have to understand as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility to seek God. We have a responsibility to set our mind on things that are honoring to God. We have a responsibility to seek God in all that we do. We have a responsibility to continually fix our eyes on Jesus. And when our minds get out of control, how do we respond? Well, the number one way, in my opinion, is memorize God's word. There is nothing better than hiding God's word in your heart. What does the psalmist say in Psalm 119? How can a young man keep his way pure but by, but by keeping it according to your law? Right? Set your mind on things above. Friends, if we are going to be a biblical church, we will have a high view of God. We will have a high view of Scripture. We will continually have a high view of God by continuing to focus on God. How are you doing at keeping your focus on God? How are you doing at keeping your family's focus on God? What is the most important thing in your marriage? What is the most important thing in your life? What is the most important thing in your family? What is the most important thing for your kids? What is the most important thing for your grandkids? If it is not God, there is a massive problem, and you better figure it out now. And if you have no, no desire to have God as number one in your life, if you have no desire to continue to fix your eyes on Jesus, friend, you have a bigger problem. Do you know that? You have a huge problem. And that problem is the problem that, that the Bible addresses in Romans 3 and Romans 6 and Daniel 12, where he says that the wages of sin, you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. We all have done wrong. And maybe you're a good person, that's fine. But if we look at the Ten Commandments, and we, we look at Leviticus 19, and we see that, that God is holy. God is the judge, okay? God, God is the, the one who is going to determine our verdict. And if we, were, if we were graded just on the Ten Commandments, we could walk through several of them. Have you ever said, oh my God, if you have, you are a blasphemer. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? Well, the, one of the commands is honor your father and mother. If you've disobeyed that, then you're rebellious. If you've ever looked at somebody and lusted, you've actually committed adultery, according to Jesus. Jesus says if you look at somebody and lust after them, you've committed adultery in your heart. Jesus said... Um, if you've hated somebody in 1 John 4, you are a murderer. You see, if, if we were judged based, just based on those right there, and God's standard is perfection, then friends, we are declared guilty right there, right? Our verdict is guilty, right? At least for me, I would be declared guilty because God's standard is perfection. But you know what? God didn't leave us there. God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This blows my mind. I wonder if it blows your mind. God sent his only begotten son to the earth to live a perfect life, to die a horrific death because of my sin, because of your sin. He died for you. And I was, as I've been going through the gospel of Matthew, I can't believe all that Jesus went through. Has anybody ever made a false accusation against you? Think about that and multiply it by a million. And that's probably something like what Jesus went through. In Matthew 22, I see three groups that have teamed up to catch Jesus in the wrong. The Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, now the Pharisees again. Now this one guy who's probably, I think, arrogant, the, the liar steps in and says, I'm going to take him to the law. All trying to catch Jesus in the wrong. 
You know why Jesus went through all of that? For you and for me. And then as Jesus, at the end of his life, when he was going through the, the trials and the crucifixion, remember, I don't like thinking about it because it makes me sad. But do you remember Jesus? When he was, when he was going before all the, the different high priests? Remember what they did to him? They spit on him? You ever thought about it? That was, and I know it's not directly, but that's kind of our spit, right? Kind of our spit that we spit on Jesus. He was whipped. It wasn't like with a belt, like as a kid when you when I got spanked with a belt. It was a, a whip that actually went into his back and ripped open his flesh. Isn't that sad? You know why he did that? He did it for you and for me. It doesn't stop there. They took a crown of thorns and they pressed it down into his head. Anybody ever get a thorn in their foot? Does it hurt? Don't try this today. Don't go stick a thorn in your head. But Jesus did that for you. The blood ran down his face because of you, because of me. That blows my mind. As those nails were beaten into his hands and feet. I don't know. I, I just want us to make it personal. Think about one of the sins you committed this week. Don't, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. But that sin was put on Jesus' hand. And then beat into the perfect body of Jesus. Wow. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Christ was beat and he died and he suffered because of your sin and my sin. And then he was buried and he rose again three days later, conquering death. And then you have the promise of Acts 16. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Romans 10. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel is is not just some outward thing. It starts in your heart, right? It's internal. And then as you walk with Christ, it becomes evident in the way that you live. If you do not know Christ, I pray that you will come to understand the seriousness of your sin, and God will break you of your pride. You will repent of your sins. You will turn from your sin, and you will turn to Christ. You will embrace the Lordship of Christ. Embrace the death burial, resurrection of Christ. If you do not know Christ, talk with me or somebody around you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is my desire that your church is a biblical church, that we will always have a high view of God. We will always have a high view of scripture. Lord, we will, that we will maintain a high view of God in our own personal lives, and in, in, in the life of our church. I pray, Father, that we would always be seeking the things above. We would always be fixing our eyes on Jesus, not because these things save us, but because it's an evidence of our faith in Jesus, because we love you so much. Lord, if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, may they come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.